Hey everyone, welcome back to Reefs Go Live. My name is Katie and I'm a marine scientist here with the Central Caribbean Marine Institute. Today, I'm gonna be your dive buddy on another underwater adventure to discover why coral reefs are so colorful. But first, I wanted to do a short recap about a few weeks ago when Dr. Claire Dell from CCMI, one of our researchers, spoke with you all about herbivores on the reef, each your reds, greens, and browns. So, basically, as a recap, Dr. Dell was talking to you students about macroalgae on the reef and how it plays a role on our coral reefs that is very important. There are red algaes, green algaes, and brown algaes. Now, each one tastes a little different and even smells a little different to different organisms underwater, which attracts different herbivorous fish, such as parrotfish or chub, some species of butterfly fishes, and even some sea urchins. So Dr. Claire Dell spoke with you guys about how there are food preferences underwater as well, just like you students may have at home. Some of you may really like carrots, some of you may hate carrots, Carrots. Some of you may really like Brussels sprouts, some of you may love them. Underwater organisms are the same. Some fish have a preference for red algae instead of brown algae or green algae. It's just the same. Now, she also went into why these are important on the reef. And if you students remember way back to our first ever Reefs Go Live broadcast, I actually spoke to you underwater about the complex world of coral reefs and how there is good algae on the reef that has that symbiotic relationship inside the coral, and there's that bad algae on the reef, which is what Dr. Dell was talking to you about, which is that macroalgae. However, that macroalgae does provide food for a lot of those herbivorous fishes and sea urchins. But if there's no herbivores to eat it, that algae can overgrow the reef and take up all that space since the reef is so competitive that the corals need to try to grow on the coral reef to provide this complex reef framework that we love to visit and snorkel and dive on. So. That was a recap from Dr. Dell's um, herbivores, each your reds, greens, and browns. If you have any more questions from that, please feel free to message us at info at reefresearch.org. For now, I'm gonna actually head in the water and get ready for our live broadcast today. So, see you underwater in a bit. Bye. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for Reefs Go Live. My name is Ashley. I am a marine scientist at the Central Caribbean Marine Institute. Today, we're going to be talking to you live from Little Cayman about the colors on the reef. You'll be joining myself, our underwater educator Katie, and the rest of our Reefs Go Live team as we take you on a dive to explore our underwater world. Before we get started, let's review how this works. We're going to be teaching you a few key learning objectives about the colors on the reef. Please follow along to see, hear, and interact with us live during this lesson. If you have any questions, type them into the chat box to the right of your screen. I'll be checking that chat box periodically and I'll relay those questions to Katie underwater. So for you students out there, there's an in-class activity sheet for you to follow. Please pay attention, follow along, and listen to all the different ways that fish use color on the reef so you can draw those examples on your activity sheet. Without further ado, let's get started. Let's check with our team down below. Katie, how is everybody doing down there? Hey Ashley, I think we're just about ready to get started down here. Everyone's in place and actually it looks like the sun's just come out so we're ready to get started whenever you are. That's great to hear. As you can see up top, we do have a tarp <laughs> behind us because there's a little bit of rain and some wind activity. But without further ado, go ahead and take it away, Katie. All right, well, welcome back everyone to Reefs Go Live. As Ashley said, my name is Katie and I'm a marine scientist with the Central Caribbean Marine Institute. And today, you students are gonna be my dive buddies once again to explore some of this beautiful coral reef that you see behind me. And today, we're gonna to talk specifically about what makes this coral reef beautiful, all about the colors on the reef and what roles this color plays. So hopefully we get to see some really cool stuff on today's dive. That sounds great, Katie, and I'm so glad the sun is out again. So speaking of, is it true that coral reefs are actually one of the most colorful ecosystems on the, in the entire world? They absolutely are, Ashley. Coral reefs are thought to be, if not the most colorful, one of the most colorful ecosystems 
only now paralleled with some very recently discovered caves in Mexico that have crystals in them, as well as, of course, the rainforest in South America. And color is the whole reason we wanted to give you students this lesson today is because colors don't just make the reef a beautiful place for us humans to explore, but they do play a role in behavior, ecology, and mating, feeding, all sorts of reasons on the reef. So today we're going to share a couple of those roles with you students throughout this dive. So diving in Little Cayman and the Caribbean is some of my favorite diving because the reefs are so colorful. But I bet for some of you students out there that dive or snorkel, you might notice that it's a little bit blue or green when you go down. Katie, can you tell us why that might happen? Absolutely. So if you students look at this reef behind me, you may notice that the very top of the reef might seem a little more colorful than maybe the base or the bottom of the reef down here. We can get a little bit closer, so come with me a little closer to the reef here, but being far away isn't what's changing that color in the water column. It's actually something called light attenuation. And light attenuation is what happens when the sunlight comes through the water, and when it reaches the top of the water, it really illuminates the top of the coral reef that you see here. So you may see some reds and purples and blues, lots of different colors. But as that light comes through the water column and reaches the bottom of the coral reef, you start to lose some of that light due to absorption in the water. And that's because that light kind of loses some of the color, starting with reds, oranges, and yellows leaving behind the blues, the greens, and the purples, which is why on some deeper dives and some deeper sites, you may see what looks like a kind of monotone looking reef, more bluish and greenish and less vibrant colors on the reef. So light attenuation is an interesting concept that can sometimes be hard to describe or demonstrate, but I do see you have a couple artificial lights with you there and a color wheel. Can you demonstrate to us how that works? Absolutely. Thanks for reminding me, Ashley. I have in my pocket here some artificial light and a color wheel. So. colors and the colors in between. We're pretty shallow right now, only about 20 feet, so light attenuation isn't having that much of an effect right now. However, the colors that you are seeing right now are different than you would see if we were on the surface, where there was no absorption of light in the water column. But if I take one of my torches here and actually shine some artificial light onto this color wheel, you may actually see a difference in that color because of the artificial light. And this is why you see a lot of underwater photographers, like Lauren is using right now, using a lot of underwater artificial lights so they can add that color back into the water column after it's lost. That was a very good demonstration, thank you. So now the light attenuation makes a little more sense. Why then are so many reef fish red? Great question, Ashley. Why don't we swim over here and we'll see if we can find some red bodied fish or darker colored fish to help answer that question. Now you students have to look really hard in the reef, inside those cracks and crevices because as light is one of those first colors lost, most fishes that are red in color are going to be nocturnal. Now what that means is that they're going to be hiding during the day and coming out more at night to hunt, feed, reproduce, things like that. Oh, we've got a stingray that's slowly making his way over here, so we'll talk about that in a second. But if you students look deep in the crevices of this reef, you may get a chance to see 
one of these red-bodied fishes, like squirrel fishes or cardinal fishes or some species of snapper as well. And the reason they're red is because since that's the first color lost due to that light attenuation we talked about, those fishes' bodies appear to be a, a dark gray or even a, a black color to predators underwater. So they don't have as many predators coming after them at night when they're active out on the reef. Okay, great, Katie. Um, so I just want to remind you students also that you can ask questions anytime during this live broadcast. If you have any questions, type them in. We'll be excited to see those. Also, the next time you're underwater, I bet you're going to look at these red fishes a little bit differently, and it's a good chance they might be nocturnal. So quickly, I want to check how your air is, Katie. How you doing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got about 2,600 PSI, so... We're good to go. And actually, Ashley, I want to swim with you students over this way. If Lauren can see it, there's actually a southern stingray coming right at us. And southern stingrays exhibit another kind of color adaptation that I wanted to talk about called countershading. Now, if you students can see underneath that stingray's wings, it's very light colored and actually pretty white. So, what that means is that when that stingray is swimming above the bottom of the ocean, any predator that's looking up in the water column at it is only seeing that light bottom of its body, and they can't really see it when they're hunting it. But if there's a predator swimming above the stingray and looking down, all they see is the dark top of it, so they can't really see it that way either. That counter shading is a a key color adaptation that a lot of apex predators and meso predators such as the southern stingray that we just saw have adapted over time to protect themselves against predators while they're feeding in the water column and that one was pretty cool because it had a bar jack on it and i don't know if you students remember but i think back in our first ever complex world of coral reefs lecture we talked about what kind of behavior that was Oh no, that was an underwater symbiosis, excuse me, called commensalism, where one organism benefits and the other is relatively unaffected. So that bar jack that was swimming with the stingray is getting a free meal from all of the bits and pieces the stingray is not eating anymore, while the stingray doesn't really carry that bar jack around. So that was pretty cool to see those two things at once. So Katie, I want to kind of bring all this together really quickly. I have a question and I want to know, can fish see things the same way that we see things underwater? Ah, great question, Ashley. And I'm sure the students are kind of wondering the same thing as well. Some fish can see the same way that you and I can and many organisms, not just marine organisms, but terrestrial organisms as well, cannot. They may have different adaptations in their eyes in their eyesight, or they may see a completely different range of color. For instance, we could see that color wheel that I had with the reds and yellows and blues and purples, but some fishes actually have a adaptation where they can see ultraviolet light or UV light as well as blue light underwater. So things in the water column that you and I can't see, they can detect because Maybe they're feeding on plankton. Plankton's very small, but it's what they feed off of. So in order to find it, they need to be able to separate those plankton from the water column that we see here. So by using or being able to see ultraviolet light, these plankton can produce their own light that only these fishes can see. That way they can feed upon them. But you and I can't see ultraviolet light or blue light unless we have a special underwater torch and a special filter that allows us to see that. So we have a question from Quad Squad. They want to know if it's possible for you to shine your flashlight on a part of the reef to see the difference in color. I don't know if that makes sense right now or if it's another part of the lesson you want to get to that, but that would be a great uh, difference to show to these students when you do find it appropriate. Yeah, that is a good suggestion. I'm looking at this reefscape behind me and trying to see if there's any corals or 
algae that are maybe a brighter color that we can't see on camera. And actually, over here, we do have some a sponge that maybe I could get Lauren to come with me a little bit closer to see. It's an orange sponge, and it's actually kind of growing over some of the coral, but it's very brightly colored. And it's a nice contrast with this um, lettuce coral that's behind it. So you can see as Lauren gets closer to this sponge, it gets brighter orange and really pops away from this lettuce coral and away from the macroalgae and all of the brown or yellow corals that are surrounding it. So as Lauren gets closer, that orange kind of comes out more, but because it's so similar to red, until she brings the artificial lights to it, it appears a little bit brownish or mottled looking. That was a great question by Quad Squad, thank you. Um, so I wanna kind of bring us back on track and talk about when you were mentioning being able to see plankton in the water. I know there are some other fish out there like angel fishes, butterfly fishes, and surgeon fishes that eat plankton, but their bright and um, patterns on their bodies might serve a different purpose. So what can you tell us about some of those type of fish that have obvious patterns or bright colors? Sure, absolutely. I can actually see a couple fishes up here on the reef, uh, sergeant majors, they're sort of swimming at the top of the reef and they have these bright uh, bars going down their bodies that are black and white and although they don't really school together, there are quite a few of them up there. <laughs> Got some curious barracuda kind of coming in from either side as well, so another perfect example of counter shading. <laughs> Anyway, back to the, the colorful reef fishes that are on the top of the reef. A lot of these fishes may have very vibrant colored bars or horizontal stripes or even some false eye spots maybe on their tail, on their caudal fin. And what these fish do when they get together is it's confusing to these apex predators or the meso predators on the reef. When you see something like a sergeant major with those bright stripes, or a butterfly fish, if it has a false eye like the four eye butterfly fish, I know that Mac, one of our videographers, got some great footage of that the other day. And you can see it's got that false eye spot on its caudal fin or its tail fin. And what that does is it allows that butterfly fish to sort of trick the apex predators into thinking it's swimming one way, but really it's swimming another way. So a lot of reef fishes have developed some colorful adaptations to try to get away from predators or to attract a mate as well. That is very interesting. Thank you, Katie. I imagine that all of us now when we go underwater and might look at some of these beautiful fishes, we might look at them a little bit differently now, knowing that that actually serves a purpose. Absolutely. But, but not all of these fishes are brightly colored, right? So some don't have those flashy patterns. What about all the silvery colored fish? Why, how might they avoid predators? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not seeing very many silvery fishes on the reef right now besides that bar jack that was nuclear hunting with that stingray that we saw, and then a couple of those barracuda. But keep your eyes out, kids, because you may actually see some swimming over the top of the reef. Right now there's a lot of blue chromis, but there may be a few more. And even the blue chromis, they have the same kind of behavior occasionally where what they'll do is they don't have these flashy patterns as Ashley said so they need to defend themselves in another way and they do this by means of schooling and schooling is what it's called when many different fishes bunch up all together and act as one larger animal or they just make it harder in general for a predator to seek out one individual fish in that whole school so it's kind of confusing for them in another way. An awesome example of this that I'm sure a lot of you have seen is in Finding Nemo. If you guys remember, the part in the movie where Nemo and Dory are asking for directions to the EAC, there's a big school of silvery fishes. And 
they all kind of face the same direction and point the same way and tell them how to get back to the EAC. Those fishes are schooling together so that they can appear like a larger animal. And then they could confuse a predator if, say, a larger barracuda or a shark were to come into that school and try to eat one of them. Great example from Finding Nemo. I'm sure that's something that a lot of students can relate to. I'm sure most everyone has seen that one by now. I want to quickly check on you, Katie. How is your air doing? Let's see. We've got about 2,200 PSI, so plenty of time for questions if anybody has one, or just continuing on with the lesson as well. Okay, so we've, color, we've covered certain patterns and bright colors for reef fish that are used for distraction or disruption. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the opposite side of that. Are there fishes that want to blend in with the reef? Oh, it's a good question. Um, I've been seeing a couple juvenile parrot fish, which are blending in with the reef, but as you said, since they are blending in, it's going to be kind of hard to see them, but we could swim maybe a little bit closer up onto the reef for a better look. Now, fishes that are blending in, same thing as terrestrial animals that are blending in. This is called camouflage. Camouflage is also very popular. I'm sure you guys have heard of it before. And not just reef fishes are doing it, but also terrestrial creatures as well. Now, as we get closer to this reef, you students may need to look very, very closely in here to look for any smaller fishes that may be kind of hanging out on or near coral that is the same color. There are some masters of camouflage. I believe we have some B-roll footage of uh, a flounder, a peacock flounder, that Mac, one of our videographers, got the other day while she was diving. And in that B-roll, that flounder is swimming across the seafloor, and it's white, just like the sand. However, that same peacock flounder has bright blue rings all over its body. And if it was to swim up onto the reef, it would express those bright blue rings so that it would say, like, I'm blending in with the reef around me and you can't see me. So some animals can actually change their color in that moment according to their behavior. And that's because they have special cells for that called chromatophores. Chromatophores allow camouflage artists to be any color they want at any time. Animals such as the peacock flounder or even an octopus, which is my personal favorite. Um, octopus are really cool and very good at blending in. Uh, so we had a quick question that about what PSI means when you're saying you have 2,500 or 2,200 PSI. And it's just a way that we check on eight, uh, Katie's air consumption and how much time we have left. So Katie, is there anything you want to add to that quickly before we move on? Oh, I think you pretty much got it. It's just a way for Ashley and I to communicate because she can't really see me underwater except for this video. So she's just checking in with me for safety reasons. That's all. <laughs> Okay, so we did get to cover counter shading before with that great example of the stingray swimming by. Um, I did have a question from some students asking about smaller fishes on the reef. Sure. They brought up the trunk fish and the cow fi cowfish. Does that count as having counter shading? It absolutely does, and I wish you would see one because I love them. Trunkfish and cowfish can absolutely have counter shading, even though I said that most counter shading examples are with some of the larger apex predators and meso predators. That doesn't mean that the smaller fishes can't do it as well. Um, sometimes you do see it in a trunkfish or a cowfish that are quite small. They have that white belly with that darker body overhead, and it's the same thing. That fish must have served a certain portion of its life out in the open ocean as a pelagic fish at one point so that it could hide from predators as well. So I actually learned earlier that a baby trunk fish is called a pea fish because they <laughs> look like tiny little peas floating around the water column. Um, so thank you for that example and great question from some of the kids there. 
So I know that we've talked a lot about um, fish using patterns to maybe blend in or hide from the reef, but it's not necessarily that all fish want to blend in and hide. Some have these bright, bold colors because they do want to stand out. So if you think about the poison dart frog that you see in Central or South America, they're very brightly and boldly colored because they want to be seen. So there are examples of that on the in the ocean as well on the reef. Katie, can you give us some examples of fish that might have bright, bold patterns because they do want to be seen on the reef? Absolutely. And you know what, Ashley, I haven't seen any on this dive, and I think that's for the best, but it would be cool to see one. Um, the first example that comes to mind is one that I bet you students know. It's an invasive fish. It is... Its name comes from a larger animal from Africa, and it came here either by hurricane, through the pet trade, or from ballast water. Can you guys think of what it might be? Well, if anybody said in class, the lionfish, you're right. I haven't seen any on this dive. They usually would be out underneath ledges, kind of hiding and waiting to jump on their prey, but the lionfish has those really bright red, brown, white, red, brown, white stripes. Very loud, and they have those large pectoral fins that they'll flare out to appear larger than they are. All of these are signaling, hey, I'm venomous, leave me alone. You don't want to come eat me because I'll hurt you. Very similar to what Ashley said about poison dart frogs in the rainforest. They are poisonous, so by having these bright, vibrant colors, they are saying to other animals in their ecosystem, don't even come near me or I'll hurt you. So we do have that example here in the Caribbean, unfortunately, now with the lionfish, but there is one other animal that you students may know. I haven't seen this one here either. It's a very close related species to the lionfish. And at first, they sort of blend into the environment. They're sort of camouflaged. But then when they feel threatened, they open up their pectoral fins, exposing really bright stripes, just like the lionfish. If any of you know it, you said the scorpion fish or the stone fish, then that's exactly what I was talking about. The scorpion fish is very closely related to the lionfish and is venomous and could actually give you a nasty sting if you were to step on one by not seeing them by accident. Because like I said, they have a lot of great camouflage. So they're another animal that's using coloration as a warning to predators. So that's probably something we should look out for, I imagine, when we're out snorkeling or diving. Keep a close eye on the reef and see if we see any stonefish or scorpion fish. Um, we've had some great questions come in about corals and why they are different colors, and that is something we're going to get to a bit on this lesson. Katie, is that something you want to talk to now? Because I have a quick question about um, fish coloration and adaptation as fish do uh, tend to grow and get older. Um, let's talk about the fish one last time. I think that's the last one we got to talk about with the fish, and then I'll see if I can find some cool coral on the reef behind me for that, that awesome color question. Right, so one of the things that uh, we do want to touch on is how that might, how reproduction or mimicry might come into play when fish age and go throughout their life cycle. So what is something that you could tell us about that? That's a great question. Um, you know what, Ashley, I think I'm going to ask you guys to come up a little bit with me and we'll look at the top of the reef because I'm seeing a lot of these fishes that you're talking about at different life stages. Fishes like the parrotfish or some of the damsel fishes. And I believe that there's quite a few up here. I can go this way a little bit. Parrotfishes are one of the fishes that change the most, their color anyway, over time based on different life cycles. And parrotfishes, when they're juveniles, when they're very, very small, may blend in with the reef so that predators are less likely to get them. But when they get older, they start to develop differences in color so that males and females can know when it's mating season which one is which. 
They also have an intermediate phase where they're kind of going from a juvenile to a male and or female and not quite ready for reproduction yet, but they're they're getting there. So they change their life cycle and they change their colors over that life cycle. And that's how they can identify each other. However, some fishes will change color just between the day and then nighttime, like surgeon fishes. Surgeon fishes during the day are just like one single color, bluish, silverish, and then at night they'll actually develop some stripes on their body. And those stripes help them to kind of blend in with the environment and not be seen so much by predators. So color is not necessarily something that will stay the same throughout a fish's entire life. It may change a lot over time as well. So one of the examples also is when Nassau groupers are spawning here, right? And that's something that's so incredible and special for the Cayman Islands. So if any of you students want to be marine scientists one day and you get a chance to work for the Department of the Environment, of Environment you might get to scuba dive or snorkel during that time when they're spawning. And that seems like an incredible opportunity to be here and see that. So I'm going to quickly come with some questions for you, Katie. We've had some great questions about coral reefs, and I think it's a good time to bring that in. Sure. So William in grade two at CSI, at CIS wants to know why coral are so many different colors. Oh, that was William you said? That was William. Oh, awesome question, William. That brings us right into where I wanted to go with this next part of the lesson anyway. So if you students remember, way back to the first ever lesson on the complex world of coral reefs, we talked about corals having a symbiotic relationship with an algae that lives inside of them. Now, if you remember, symbiotic relationship means that they, one cannot live without the other, so they rely on each other completely to survive. And these corals on this reef behind me all have algae inside of them. And actually, I see a coral that I want to use for this example, which is pretty perfect. That zooxanthellae not only gives that coral all of its nutrients, but it also gives it its color. So, for example, this coral right here, if Lauren can get a little bit closer, is two different colors. There's kind of some greens to it, and there's some browns to it as well. So you can see here it looks a little bit green in color around the edges, and then in the center there's a lot of browns too. Now, this means that there's probably two different kinds of that symbiotic algae living inside this one coral which are giving it its color. So even one coral can have more than one algae living inside of it. But also, many of these corals will have different algae living inside of each different kind of coral. Some work better with others than they do with some. So those are what provide the reef, both the soft corals, like the sea fans that you see behind me, which are usually a purple or a yellow color, as well as the stony corals here with their different colors as well. It's that synthetic, that photosynthetic algae that's living symbiotically within that coral. So that was an awesome question, William. <laughs> that was a great question and it helped bring together the lesson quite nicely. So another quick question, Anjali wants to know what is the most common type of coral that we see here on our reefs? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> the most common type of coral that we're seeing. Um, well, I would say on the reef behind me, we've got a lot of lettuce coral. So, lettuce coral is this coral right here. It's kind of, um, how do you describe it besides the fact that it looks like lettuce? <laughs> It sometimes can create these folds, but it can also encrust as well. So this is a lettuce coral that has different folds coming out of it. But then up here is another kind of lettuce coral that's more encrusting over the reef. I would say that those lettuce corals are pretty common, as well as 
this coral here, which is a great star coral or a mountainous star coral. It's got really big polyps that live inside of it. On this particular reef, this reef site, I would say those two are probably the two most common that we're seeing. Katie, another question from Sean. This is great, by the way. I'm so happy that we're getting a lot of questions coming in. Yeah, this is awesome. Sean wants to know if colors on the reef change all around the world. That's a great question. Oh, that is a great question. Um, colors on the reef all around the world depend on a lot of things. Uh, Miss Ashley and I were actually talking about this up top before we went on our dive. And it's interesting because you can have groupers and snappers and eels here in the Caribbean and around the Cayman Islands that we see that are pretty common here. And there's relatives of these groupers and snappers and eels all over the world, but just different species individually. And therefore they may belong to the same family or be very closely related, but be a little bit different maybe in how they look or in their colors. Maybe fishes here in the Caribbean that are parrot fishes change color every few months according to their life cycle. But there are some species that maintain one color all throughout their life in the Pacific Ocean. Color in the water column also depends on a lot of different things. Here in Little Cayman, as you students can see behind me, we're pretty lucky that we have really good water quality and the sunlight is able to reach down pretty far in the reef, letting us see a lot of those different colors. But say that there was some construction going on just offshore that was bringing up a lot of sand and sediment from the bottom or from freshwater runoff coming into the reef, that would create the, vis the visibility would go way down and we couldn't see the colors like we currently can see them. Maybe uh, there's a big algae bloom in the area. There's some places in the world where there's so much nutrients going into the water that it creates lots and lots of planktonic algae just in the water column here. Like you can kind of see a little bits in front of me now, but a lot more. That will change the color as well because it's blocking out a lot of that sunlight. So light attenuation and the colors that we see on our coral reef may sometimes differ, but maybe it's more of an outside influence, not necessarily because of the animals themselves as well. So Katie, I'm sad to say it looks like it's about time we're going to wrap up this lesson. So before we log off, was there anything else you wanted to say to our students? Well, I guess I just want to say thank you all once again for being my dive buddy on this dive. I know I enjoyed it. I'm happy that the sun came out because it was really stormy when we got in. So I know that that could have been a little bit of a problem for us. And thanks for being willing and happy to learn about all the different colors on the coral reef. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask us now. And hopefully I'll get a chance to go up topside with Miss Ashley and answer those questions for you. But. Until the next time I see you on Reefs Go Live, hope you guys enjoyed and we'll see you soon. Sounds good, Katie. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you students for your great questions and for tuning in today. Um, I just want to say that I look forward to another Reefs Go Live. And from all of us here on the Reefs Go Live team, thank you so much. And we will see you next time.